Hey, so just want a bit of housekeeping before going back to physics. Um, the eighth problem set's due Friday. I put it up late, so it's due late. Um, do remember to do it. You got another two days to do it. Okay, so I, I'm about to leave water, steam, and ice just for my own peace of mind. I want to say two cents about it before going on to clothing, insulation, and climate. The two cents is this. I'm trying to give you things to take away that, that, that hopefully in some years in the future you'll still remember them well enough to, to be able to use them. And that is, got, we've got three phases of matter. You knew about those already. Solid, liquid, gas. They're, they're the primary phases of matter. And they're busy places. At the atomic molecular level, you get down fine enough, you discover the, the world's full of motion and action. Um, it may not get anywhere, but, it's, but there's, a, there's things, things are happening. And at the surfaces, the interfaces between the various phases of matter, the three phases of matter, you get among the, among the types of action that are going on is an is a endless exchange of molecules coming and going. With, with water and ice, there's a, they're coming and going off the surface of the ice. They're entering the water phase. The water phase molecules are landing in the ice, entering the solid phase. There are molecules moving around within the phases. Um, I mentioned early in the semester that, that if I open a bottle of perfume here, even if the air is totally still, the perfume will eventually reach you. How? It's because of this molecular motion that's going on in a gas. They're jittering around mo molecules, and they're making these random trips, what, random walks. The meandering of the molecules, they will eventually reach you. The, the room, uh, even though there's no net movement of molecules across the room, the perfume molecules will exchange, drift, in, uh, replaced by ordinary gas molecules, and they'll eventually reach you. So there's action in, in the midst of gases. There's action in solids. Molecules can, can move through solids. Um, you might think that, it, that it's, a, it's a rigid, fixed system. Nothing happens. No, it does happen. Um, a, a, an example of, 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 of that is in the context of uh, your, all your electronics. You know, with time, a lot of electronic gear goes bad. It just it ages, like, the, like these lights, these LED lights. Um, there are none that are obviously fail, but, you, but you've seen on the LED lights, say, in the back of a, of a, a car, they're the, the, the ones that are the stop lights and stuff like that. You eventually lose them. You, you, you surely have seen LED displays where they start to lose the LEDs. Why did the LEDs stop working? Part of it has to do with the migration of atoms and molecules through the solids that are the light emitting diodes. They're, they're not static things. There's motion. OK, so get back to business. The, the three phases of matter, they're perpetually exchanging molecules. Uh, we'll focus on water, steam, and ice. And if the exchange is imbalanced, unbalanced, that is, one of the phases is losing more molecules to the, to the other phase than are, than are coming back, you lose the, the phase that's losing a, that has a net loss of molecules shrinks at the expense of the other phase. And this happens everywhere in your, your, your lives. It's, it's you f uh, freezing water in the ice tray in your, in your freezer. The, 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 the shift is towards ice because you've unbalanced the exchange. Or when water's evaporating off your skin after you've taken a shower, it's going into, uh, uh, into the gas phase because you've unbalanced the exchange and so on. Okay? So there, it's, it's, that's the... the cause of phase, uh, the cause. That's what's happening in a phase transition. Phases can coexist. There are certain cir circumstances where the balance is perfect and this phase will just sit there. The two phases will sit there, or even three phases will just sit there. Um, last thing I wanted to go back to, unless you have questions, um, is, is the relative humidity, because that's something that you, that, that you, you uh, deal with frequently. You're dealing with it right now. It's cold weather out there. For interesting reasons, that means that the humidity of the indoor air is very low. And so you tend to lose a lot of water molecules off your skin. And so you get chapped lips, and you, your hair behaves differently, and all sorts of things, because of the low relative humidity right now. And during the summer, it's the other way around. Every, you're all dripping wet, and it's different. 
relative humidity is a measure of, of how dense the water vapor is in the air relative to what? Relative to uh, enough water molecule that, you, that it would be in phase equilibrium with, with a pool of water. So if I have a pool of water out here and there's no net exchange of water molecules between the air and the water, then the humidity must be 100%, 100% relative humidity. There's enough water molecules that the exchange is balanced. In general, the, 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 the air that we live in is less than 100% relative humidity, meaning that if you bring out a tub of water and let it all at the same temperature and you expose it to this air, there's going to be a net loss of water molecules by the liquid. There are not enough in the gas to go back. If it's 90% relative humidity, there are 90% of enough to keep the balance. And therefore, the evaporation will be slow. It will be, there'll, be, there'll be evaporation, but not a lot of it. Um, on the other hand, if it's 10% relative humidity, that means that there's so few water molecules in the gas phase to come back uh, that, that the balance is way off. The water molecules are leaving way more often from the liquid water than they're returning. And so the water evaporates fast. So this explains why. Uh, in the air in this room, the water will evaporate pretty fast. It's low relative humidity. I don't know what it is, but it's probably 40% or something. On a hot summer day when it's really humid outside, then the evaporation's slow. And you feel, it feels muggy. It feels like evaporate. Water sits on surfaces, and it doesn't evaporate fast. You all OK with that idea? The last piece of that is, is to imagine taking air just to, to, to to flesh out the story of why is the humidity in here low now. It's because if you take air that's outside in the cold, and that is, even, even let it be 100% relative humidity, let it be, it, go get, gr grab some air right over the Dell pool, that pool over there. So it's 100% relative humidity, perfect, in balance with the water right there, let's say. You grab that air in a bottle, you bring it in here, and you warm it up. When you warm it up, now when you do the comparison of, of the landing and leaving, are they imbalanced? You do it not against the water that's, that's cold over there in the pool, but water in here that's at room temperature. And now this air doesn't have enough uh, water molecules in it to balance the landing and leaving process. That water in the room here now is hotter. And therefore, it has more molecules coming off its surface every second. So we're out of balance all of a sudden. The air that was 100% relative humidity at low temperature, you know, freezing temperature, is now 40% relative humidity here at room temperature. And if you can make it hotter still, it'll be even lower relative humidity. OK? So moving air from one temperature to another, you change the relative humidity. Any, any questions before I leave the story? Okay. New topic then. Well, I mean, still, they're all flowing from one another. And that is, that is clothing insulation and climate. And the fact that you all are well aware that it's cold outside right now has to do with our nature as, 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 you know, as human, the, human, the human species. We are warm blooded animals, meaning that, that we deliberately maintain a, 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 an elevated temperature inside our bodies. Um, it happens to be a spe relatively specific temperature and, and all that. But like, why do that? There are an awful lot of animals that don't, that, that don't worry about it. They just let their temperature be whatever the temperature is. So on a hot day, the temperature of the animal's hot. And on a cold day, the temperature of the animal's cold. Well, a primary reason for you know, a, a difference, that those so-called cold-blooded animals, the rate at which they do chemical reactions changes with temperature. As you, as you warm up almost any chemical system, the, the reactions speed up. Why? Because there's more thermal energy around. Thermal energy often acts as uh, the activation energy for making a reaction happen. Remember that? For when you light a fire, you light a fire. You're putting in energy to get the reaction started, to, to pay for the original uh, breaking apart of molecules or disassembly to, before you do a reassembly. So reactions are often chemical, de uh, temperature dependent. And as a result, the, the, the colder it gets, the slower the chemistry that, that makes up the animal 
a cold-blooded animal becomes, and their entire life slows down. This is, this is assuming they don't freeze. Freezing is a, a, a disaster, essentially, for all living organisms. Well, I, that, that's way overstated, but, but animals don't like to freeze. And there are some animals that, that, that live in environments that get so cold that they really, this is a, this is a potential problem for them, and therefore, uh, they, they, they have adapted to, to have antifreeze, for example, in their, in their cells to prevent them from freezing. And we know a little bit of how, how you do that. How do you do it? Keep the water busy in various ways so the water can't, the, the exchange of, of molecules between the liquid water in the cells and any ice that happened to form is unbalanced such that the ice shrinks and the water grows. You know, do that deliber deliberately. And some, some animals actually do do that deliberately. Anyway, nobody wants to freeze. Um, there may be some animals that, that, that survive freezing. I, it's not, not my field. Anyhow, they do slow down. The chemistry slows down. Everything they do slows down. They probably experience time differently when it's cold. I mean, they, they surely do. And that's fine as long as every, all the animals slow down. Basically, winter becomes surprisingly short because nobody's, nothing's happening very fast. Um, however, once warm-blooded animals or warmer-blooded animals started to develop, they don't slow down in cold weather because they deliberately keep their temperatures high. They, the, their chemical reactions happen at the same old speed. Um, we, we're, just as, we're just as fast in the, in, the, in the winter as we are in the summer, you know, fast by whatever measure you like. And therefore, um, the warm-blooded animals had a huge predatory or otherwise advantage over the cold-blooded animals. So it's so... You know, the mammals are warm-blooded. Um, it's, we, we can do things in the winter that cold-blooded animals can't do. We're not dependent on the temperature the same way. There is a cost to that, though, and that is keeping yourself warm in cold environment is a challenge. Okay, any questions about cold-blooded animal issues, like that kind of, that, those ideas? All right. Um, so, so we operate... At a, at a higher temperature, you know, 98.6 Fahrenheit or 37 Celsius, 20, uh, 20 oh God, 37 Celsius, yes. Um, approximately, not, I mean, some of you have a higher temperature, some have lower, depends on many little things. But, but once you get that hot and we go out in a cold environment, now we've got problems. And so, so we've got some, some adaptations that are, that are great. Um, we, you, you, well, it's easy to think of body temperature as one value. It's not, it's not the case. We have different body temperatures. Um, I think the, the 98.6 is basically a core body temperature, and the others are uh, elsewhere. We, we allow our periphery, our hands, for example, and our feet to get colder in cold weather. The advantage of doing that is if you let your hands get colder, the temperature difference between your hands and the environment is smaller. And the flow of heat it, it is at least, uh, well, I shouldn't say this. It depends on the temperature difference. The bigger the temperature differences you have between here and here, all else being equal, the faster the heat flow is. So, so allowing your hands to get colder in a cold environment means that the heat flow out of your hands is smaller. Um, you don't lose it as fast. If it's super duper cold outside, the little, these little changes in body surface temperature may not matter, but, but for the most part, they do matter. And so uh, letting your hands go, get colder is all very well if there were sort of no connection between your hand and the rest of your body except just you know, the whole length of your arm. In fact, the, there is a problem, and that is that we send blood out to our hands and it comes back, and it's going out and back all the time. It's a busy, another busy place. And that uh, means that if you let your hand get colder, now it's cold, your body's warm, there's going to be a heat exchange from, from your body to your hands, tending to warm up your hands. And it's going to fight the, the temperature difference. So how do we manage to pull it off? Well, we use a technique called countercurrent exchange. It's just natural in, in probably a huge number of animals. But, but as blood is going out in your arteries, out to your hands, it is exchanging heat with blood returning from your hands and your veins. So heat is flowing across. And instead of carrying all the heat from your core in every, in every drop of blood, the heat doesn't make it all the way out to your hands to be lost. 
it, it is uh, drawn away, as it heads out in your arteries, it's drawn away by, by the blood coming back in your veins. So you, you use it to warm the blood back up, so the blood, when it gets back to, you, to your body, is up, up at full body temperature. So, so the, the, the blood goes the whole distance, but the heat doesn't. The heat sort of goes out and ma makes a shortcut and comes back. And as a result, you can let your hands get colder, your feet get colder, and we just, we just do it naturally. It's part of life. Is that okay? Another strategy is put as thermally insulating materials as you can in the, in the surf, near the surface of, of, of your skin. Well, subcutaneous fat, we have, we, I guess we all have it to some extent, some more than others, but it's, it's an insulator. Fat is, is a poorer conductor of heat than other wa you know, water-based water you know, uh, muscle tissue, for example. So developing uh, insulating layers. Hair, obviously hair is good. And hair is good for the reason that I talked about, uh, I've talked about before, that, that the real insulator when you're, when you're dealing with hair and things like hair is not the hair itself. It's, it's the air trapped by the, by the hair. And, and you know, why, why do you need the hair? Because air by itself will undergo convection. If you heat it up, for example, the top of your head, different people have different amounts of hair, right? So if you got no hair and you heat up the air near the top of your head, it's, it becomes naturally buoyant in the surrounding colder air, and up it goes to be replaced by new, new cold air. So it's a, it's a chronic loss of heat. Ah. So how do you stop that? If you put the, put the hair there, it traps the, the air. You, heat, you still heat the air. Hair and air sound the same. You still heat the air, but it can't move easily because it experiences viscous drag. It's, try, it, it, it's in this small environment, that little environment of slow moving stuff. In that context, you can get uh, viscous drag as opposed to pressure drag. But in any case, you get, you get drag forces that, that stop, the, that make the flow very difficult. So you end up with a layer of, of heated air at the top of your head, which is, which is nice. And it has difficulty drifting away in order to be replaced by cold air. So it keeps you warm. And in the absence of, of adequate hair, we, uh, we, we wear the equivalent of hair. So everybody here is wearing fiber-based, probably without exception, fiber-based uh, materials, surface uh, uh, structures that trap the air. And to give you, just for, for fun and games, to give you an idea of how effective fiber, it, fiber and air insulation. So, so the, basically the fiber's purpose being to trap the air, not to be the insulator, and the air's purpose to be the insulator that arrangement is really effective and really widely used. So it's not only used just in your clothing, it's used in buildings. So you know, someday or other, you, you, you may already or you will care about buildings and building insulation, how much you're paying on the heating bills, and there's a, whole, you know, a thousand reasons to be, to be paying attention to the flow of heat out of your house on a cold day. Also, the flow of heat into your house on a hot day. But how do you, how do you slow that down? Trap air and fibers. And so uh, the, the classic insulation for houses, uh, well, hey, historically it was asbestos and stuff like that, not so popular anymore. But, but glass fibers is fiberglass, fluffy stuff is, is, a, is a nice choice. I've done this experiment in the past with fiberglass insulation, and it works OK. The problem is I'm going to hold a blowtorch to it. And you can melt glass with a blowtorch. And so you can melt fiberglass insulation, and it's a stinky mess. So this fluffy stuff is actually ceramic fiber as opposed to glass fiber. It has a much higher melting temperature. And so I can do stuff, hopefully, like I can hold, I got a penny on there, OK? And I am going to heat the penny. Ideally, I will heat it red hot. And obviously, I don't want to heat my hand red hot. So I'm, so I'm holding a blowtorch to a penny about one inch away from my hand. And if there were no, actually, I just melted the penny, which, which, which fell and marked the table, which is nice. <sighs> cool off. OK, so I melted a penny onto the table while holding it. 
So in that much space, that, that insulation is so effective. I never felt, you know, I never felt a thing. <laughs> right, I, completely oblivious to the temperature there. Um, so it's stunningly good at, at blocking the flow of heat. Gases are, basically gases are terrible conductors of heat. Some are, are even worse or, than others. It turns out the, the ones that are made of, the bigger, the, the, the more massive the particle, that's in the gas. The slower it travels, remember that helium and the little guys carry, they move faster. Each one gets the, the same dose of thermal, thermal kinetic energy, so the little guys move faster. Um, those little guys moving faster means the heat flows better. So helium is a better conductor of heat than air. On the other hand, carbon dioxide or argon or z krypton, xenon, those are uh, worse conductors than air. And so in, in situations where you're going to trap a gas for a long period of time as a thermal insulator, they'll actually use exotic gases. I mean, argon's easy, um, an easy choice. It, it, it carries heat less well than air does. So I mean, to, to, to give you an example, double pane windows. A lot of double pane windows are sealed with not air in between them, but with argon between them, because it's the worst conductor of heat. Makes it, you know, a little difference makes it, you know, it's, it's something. Okay? Um, so, a lot of fiber insulation around. Um, other th you know, things to ask you, look, I can ask you this, this question here. You know, it, 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 controlling the flow of heat uh, radiated. Controlling the flow of heat. What? Uh, <laughs> hello? That was odd. <laughs> it's still odd. Okay. So, so, to keep as cool as possible while fighting a forest fire. <laughs> oh, please. Hello, hello? Forest fire. <laughs> That's what the, yeah. Too many gadgets. How do we forest fire. <laughs> I love technology. Okay, you can hear me, right? Is that true? Okay, we don't have the other gadgets love here listening and hear me piping in later. Okay, so to keep as cool as possible, while fighting a forest fire, what color clothes do you want to wear? We've talked about this. So while well, fighting a forest fire, what color clothes do you want to wear? Ready? We've talked about this. So while fighting a forest fire, what color clothes do you want to wear? Ready? We've talked about this. While fighting a forest fire. This, so you well, you first. I'll give you another uh, five seconds and then we'll call it. I'm expecting, yes, very, very high rate of seconds and then we'll call it. I'm expecting, yes, very one, zero. Yes, two, very one. shiny metal. In, in the infrared, yes, two, very one. shiny metal. Yeah, most materials. Are black. I talked about that actually before I forget. Any metal. With, yeah, most I'll materials play with that was are black. I talked about that. With speaker with a microphone. Black. I talked about that. Most things are black, which means that they're extremely good at absorbing. In black. I talked about that. Most things are black, which means that they're extremely good at absorbing. As good as black. possible at emitting their own thermal radiation in the infrared. And so, as good as black. black the exchange is, 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 is really good with almost everything with, with and so as good as shiny stuff. The metallic shiny is, is protective. And, and so, so as good as to keep almost anything warm in a, in and so so good in a cold environment, keep or anything almost cold anything in a hot environment. You basically want to shut down the exchange of heat. Almost cold anything in a hot strategies to use, the one associated with thermal energy. It was anything the strategies to use, so this the is one a, associated with the, the, uh, the, the, the blankets that people wear, the metallic blankets people wear. Uh, associated with the, the, uh, the marathon the, when they're the blankets that people wear, the out of chemical potential energy with which to make heat. And if the weather out of, the people wear the energy, out of chemical potential energy with which to make, make heat. More of it. And they'll become bitter cold. And I remember one, one friend who heat with which to make heat. On, just, just I become bitter cold. I remember one one friend who heat with which to make heat. I become bitter cold. I remember one one way to do that. 
shut down thermal radiation by one become bitter. Basically, yeah, and they can laugh at you as a tinfoil hat wearer, but it's okay. All right. Yeah, they can laugh at you as a tinfoil hat wearer. Um, second question, actually, along that same line. I can, I, I'll ask you this one here. Try this one. You got two sweaters. They're exactly a centimeter what? thick, uh, but one weighs fifty percent more than the other. They're both made exactly out of a centimeter. Um, which is the better insulation? Weighs fifty percent more than the other. They're both. They're not in some ex some wacky extreme where there's only one fiber in the in the sweater. More than the sweater. other. They're both. You okay with the question? Do you want a heavier sweater? More than the other. They're both. Sweater. You okay, okay with the question? Same thickness though. Do you want a heavier? So, do you want a heavier? So, do you want a heavier? Yeah, it, I mean, the, the, the voting is going the, not the way I so, expect. Do I so, let me make sure it's clear that we're talking about two sweaters that you, the way I so, expect. Do I They're the same thickness. They're both a centimeter thick. The way I so, expect is one of them packs 50% more fibers into that same. The way I is one centimeter. One of them packs 50% more fiber. Talk about. Why don't you guys discuss this to the extent you can? Fifty percent more fiber to do it. See whether we get a shift in the voting. We, actually, we have already started getting a shift. Fifty percent more fiber to do it. See whether we get a shift in the voting. We, actually, we shift in the voting. We actually shift in the voting. We actually. All right. We'll, we'll finish it up. Five, four, three, two. One. We'll finish it up. Five, you got this four, one, you know, in quotes, right or wrong, and maybe it, depending on, on how you interpreted the question. So got four, one, you know, but, but the right or wrong, and maybe it, depending is, on, is on the how you your sweater would be the better insulator. And the point of this is, you know, why? So depending on, is on the how you sweater would be the, the why better is insulator. because the goal is and to trap point, the air. The sweater itself is not the insulator. Because so the goal you, is to you made a sweater that was. It's one centimeter thick that is solid. Uh, so the goal is to do made a sweater that was here. It's it one centimeter thick. Animal like, horns and stuff are made of essentially the same material. They're basically matted. They're it's 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 one centimeter hair. They're not very good insulators anymore because the, the material, the protein. They're it's it's one centimeter hair. hair. They're, they're not, not very good like insulators it's, anymore because the, the material, the protein. Air is a, air is a better insulator than it is. So the goal is to trap the air. Protein insulator. So. So overly dense to trap the air. Insulating any of that is counterproductive for insulation. You, you, you've replaced the insulator. Any of that insulator is counterproductive with more wool, for insulation. Which isn't such a good insulator. You, so you actually want the light and you want it sort of as fluffy as such a good it can insulator. be. So well, you still actually want the light and the you air. want it sort of as fluffy as such a good. And this is one of the reasons why different you can buy down coats. And, and when Exploration such a good. And this is one of the reasons uh, why different they'll pitch you, different uh, qualities of down and so on to you, and what why different they'll pitch the different uh, qualities of down and so on to you. That succeeds in trapping the air, and so the, the, the so on to you. Yes, downs are that very light. Succeeds in trapping the air. There's almost nothing. And so they have almost no weight because they're, they're they're just fluffy little hairs. Trapping the air. There's almost yeah. nothing. And, uh, if 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 you overstuff. The, uh, the air. There's almost nothing. You shove it in, then you uh, cram if, it. If, if you overstuff down without the air in it, it's not as good an insulator. If you overstuff down, okay with that idea? Trap the air. Uh, that's certainly stuff down. down. Okay with that idea? You overstuff the building air. insulation. You sh you try to put in five layers of 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 overstuff the building air. insulation, you sh and, you and you try to put in five layers of one layer of fiber should occupy. You you know that's a bad move. That's exactly five layers of one layer of fiber should occupy. Let it be as you, fluffy as you know, that's necessary. That's a bad. So, for example, ceiling insulation, roof, uh, uh, just below the roof. You, the, you know, that's a, it's often very thick. A, a, no, if it's in the attic, nobody really goes up there and cares thick. that the fact that it's this thick. But you want it that thick because it's the air that's the insulator. If you if you decide, oh gosh, we want to put in a playroom up thick, here because so it's the air that's the insulation down to this thickness. Which you could do, because it's the air that's the that insulation. It'll still be just as good. The answer is no, it won't. You will now because it's the air that's the. I think I made my point. You will now because it's the air that's the. I think I made my.
I told you about double pane windows. It's one of the last things, I guess. Oh, well, okay. Double, double pane windows. I, um, why you have double pane? Because if you have a single pane of glass and it's between a hot room and a cold outside, the heat, the, the heat flows through that one pane of glass pretty readily. Glass is a, on the grand scheme of things, not a very good conductor of heat, but it's not bad. And the heat that can flow through a, a window from, from air at room temperature to air at freezing temperature, going through that single pane, pretty large amount of heat can flow through that. It's a bad idea if you've ever had a house that has that. It, you get cold. It's, that, that surface, that the, basically the window develops a temperature that's somewhere in between the outdoor temperature and the indoor temperature. It's, it, the, two, the two places are fighting over its temperature. So it's probably halfway between them, about. And so it's cold. It's, it is black in the infrared, and therefore you are radiating heat toward it, and it's not radiating back nearly as much. So when you stand next to it, you feel cold because you're staring at a cold surface. Um, lots of bad things there. So what do you do? Put two panes of glass with air or some gas between them. To the, so, so now you have an insulator in there. Uh, air, is real, air is good. Argon's better. Put argon in there. Fine. So now you can get the inside pane almost to room temperature and the outside pane almost to outside temperature. There's a big temperature difference between them and therefore across that trapped gas, but the trapped gas is terrible at carrying the heat. Yeah, it doesn't have any fiber to keep it put, so it can move. And so it does. For a vertical window, it undergoes convection. The hot side, we're, we're thinking, I'm thinking winter. So the hot side is, is right at the surface of, of the indoor pane, the pane that's closest to you inside. That air heats up and rises. It rises all the way to the top of the window and then descends. It creates a convection cell that's very tall and very skinny. It's rising on the inside pane and descending on the outside pane. Can you visualize that? It's pretty crummy at carrying heat because the two flows experience viscous forces against each other. They're very tall. The air has to go the whole way up and the whole way down. It's not very effective. And so convection is not very good in a vertical double pane window. If you put that same double pane structure as a skylight, it's not as good an insulator because now the convection cells that form are short. They're little guys because the air is heated by the inside pane, which is on the bottom, rises to the top pane and comes back down. So in the winter, um, skylights are a potential loss of heat, even though they're double pane. They're not, it, that's not very good. So far, so good? You, you, you shut down conduction by using air as an insulator, or gas as an insulator. You shut down convection by making it difficult in a, in a uh, window oriented vertically, the normal way a window is, is put. Last thing to deal with, and that is uh, radiation. Heat can move between those two panes. Remember, one pane is at room temperature, approximately. The outside pane is at, at outdoor temperature, approximately. They're staring at each other, exchanging thermal energy. And they're black in the infrared. So that's potentially a pretty l big exchange of energy from, what, from inside to outside. He can go. Um, so there's a modern trick. The modern trick is to put a shiny surface on one of those panes so that it's ref it reflects thermal energy. And therefore, the uncoated pane sees a reflection of itself and sees its, its own thermal energy coming back. And the coated pane is terrible at emitting or absorbing thermal radiation. Okay? The issue, though, is, of course, in saying that, it's like, yeah, sure, you can, you can mirror the surface of one of them with, with like aluminum or silver, but then you can't see through it. And so there are lots of gadgets in, in this building, scientific ones, where they are deliberately mirrored to shut down thermal radiation exchange. But that's not very good if you want to make a window that you can see through. So what do you use? Turns out you can use, there are materials or techniques for applying a, a coating that is reflective of infrared light but transparent in the visible. So they're, they're, they are transparent conductors. They're, they're electrically conducting materials, but they stop being conducting for the, 
for the, for the frequencies involved in visible light. And you might think, well, what is this exotic stuff? A, a, a material that conducts electricity and yet you can see through it. Some fair fraction of you are staring through that material right now. Your computer screens, they involve, a, you know, the screen's controlled electronically, right? All the little pixels are turned on and off electronically. So there are electrical conductors all through that screen with which they can do what they need to do. But you're looking through them. So they are transparent conductors. And um, you know, so they're part of every, dis all these displays are filled with transparent conductors. Uh, they, they're by and large tin, tin oxide, tin, r things related to tin oxide. And if they apply those same materials to the inside of, of one of those two panes of glass in a double pane window, they create what they call a, a, a low E window. So if you ever, if you've ever, somewhere in your future, if not in your past, you, you may be bu buying windows and they will pitch at you low, low E. That's low emissivity. That is, quietly, you know, without telling you the details in, in their sales brochure, it's got a transparent conductor inside it, one that reflects thermal radiation at, uh, of the room temperature variety. And so you can see, th you can see through it even though uh, uh, thermal energy bounces off of it. So, tra yeah, tra so it reflects thermal energy but transmits visible light. What I want to show you just for fun and games here is there, the infrared light is different. It's hard, it's hard to tell from looking at something what, what, what's going on in the infrared. And so it's hard, we, it's hard to tell. Why am I, there we go. Okay, so we're back to this. Hard, right. you, it's hard to tell. Why am I, there we are, go. Okay. Are glowing so away we're back to this. Hard, right. It's hard to tell. Thermal energy, approximate room temperature. Is that coming up? Yes, it, it's visible. Thermal energy, so approximately at room temperature. I mean, the colors are yes. false yes. colors because what they're telling you is basically how, how what, what's the temperature the of colors the colors are yes. false colors because what they're telling you is basically how, how what, what's the temperature of the colors are yes. false emitting, an, uh, emitting thermal radiation. Okay? So I've got the colors are false emitting, an, uh, 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 emitting thermal radiation. Okay? The balloon is, is, tra is not transparent, right? In the visible, you can't see through it. In the infrared, radiation. Though, okay? It's transparent. It's not super perfect transfer, but pretty radiation. Good show. Okay. Pretty radiation. Show. Okay. So, it's many many things to take away from this. Th that is, if we could see. In So things would look different. They are transparent. There are so to different wavelengths of light. Different. Are transparent. This is a. There are so how to, to different wavelengths in a discrete fashion. This is why there are privacy issues. So how to, to different wavelengths when they do imaging with various other wavelengths of light that we can't use. So how to different wavelengths when they do imaging of light with various other wavelengths of light that we can't use. So how to different wavelengths when they do. Have I said enough? So, when they do, it's, it's obviously been a big, have big I said to enough? do with TSA and all that. The, n yeah, people want their privacy. So enough? To do with different with TSA and all that. Things. The, n this yeah. is a people want reverse case of the transparent conductor. Here I am. N this yeah. is a people want reverse case of the transparent conductor. Here I am. N this yeah. is a in the infrared. A transparent conductor is the opposite. It is and this is a seared in the visible. A transparent conductor is the opposite. Reflected. It is and this is a seared in the visible. A transparent conductor. Infrared is a different world. It's different. It's a different part of the uh, electrical. Well, a transparent conductor. We see things. Infrared is a different world. It's different. And again, uh, if you want to save. It's a different world. It's different. On your heat budget and other things, uh, putting in, dealing with the emissivity of. Objects that are hot or cold matters, and so I mean, people. Uh, I think there's a modern movement to some extent of, of replacing uh, roofing tiles. Historically, roofing tiles have been black. Most mostly about black roofs. Well, that may not be the right choice for the future. 
uh, it, it's, inf it, you know, it's as good as possible at absorbing solar radiation. Do you want to do that? I don't know. Okay? It's the last major topic to talk about, and, and I've probably got about the right amount of time for it if I turn everything. Okay. So climate, and so I've talked about the, the issues of exchanging heat, how to do it well, how to do it badly. Climate is a, is a, is a global issue uh, in which heat plays a dominant role. You know, it's, it's all about heat. And so here's the story in a, in a, in a the big picture story is, as we send more so-called greenhouse gases into the Earth's atmosphere, we cause the Earth to trap more and more thermal energy. And the temperature here at the surface of the Earth goes up. And that's causing all kinds of changes in climate. It's going to be, if not the big issue in your future, it's going to be a major issue in your future. I would say some of you are going to have shorter lifespans because of it. I mean, just put it in a real, in, in, in a real context. It's going to seriously affect some of your lives, um, maybe even the ultimate serious, OK? So, so it's you know, setting aside all the politics and other gobbledygook. It's a real effect, and here's the, here, here's the story. So there, there are actually a number of ways looking at how, at how the, uh, the addition of these gases to the atmosphere uh, affect the temperature here at the surface of the Earth. But one that I particularly like, given to me by a, a, a friend from, from another university years ago, is, is the following idea. It takes a couple of pieces to sort of assemble the story. So the first piece of the story is that the Earth is this little island in the middle of empty space that is receiving thermal energy from the sun and sending thermal energy out into the great wide universe. So there are two things going on. Thermal energy is coming from the sun, and thermal energy is coming from the Earth out into the great wide world, you know, beyond the world, whatever. And those two have to be in balance. Uh, they can briefly be out of balance, but suppose more thermal energy comes to us from the sun than we send out into the great wide world by thermal radiation, incidentally. Uh, in that case, there's a net accumulation of thermal energy at the, at, the, at the Earth. So the Earth's temperature will rise. And as it rises, it will radiate more thermal energy. Because remember, the thermal radiation goes as the fourth power of the absolute temperature. So, so there will come a point when you know, assemble the Earth and the sun and empty, basically empty space and, and just let things happen, the things will move around until they reach thermal equilibrium. Thermal, they'll reach an equilibrium, where as much thermal energy is coming in every second as is leaving every second. They'll, get a, they'll reach a balance point, a stable equilibrium. What's that situation? Well, just based on geometry and assuming that the Earth is, is pretty much a, a black object, approximately, so it's as good at, at re receiving thermal energy as it can be from the sun, and as, a, as good at, at emitting it from the, uh, into space as it can the balance, temperature, there's a temperature of, of that balance. And it happens to be minus 18 degrees Celsius. It's cold. If, if the temperature were lower, it wouldn't radiate heat away fast enough, and sun, the sun's heating would, would warm it up. If it were hotter than that, it would radiate heat away too fast, and the sun couldn't make that up, it would cool down. So that's where, it's, that's where it wants to settle, it's minus 18 Celsius. Well, it's not minus 18 Celsius down here on average. It's warmer than that. Well, there's a reason for why it's warmer than that down here on the surface of the Earth. It's because the Earth, the Earth is a, 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 a somewhat a complex object. It emits thermal radiation from, from its parts. The actual surface of the Earth glows with thermal radiation, but so does some of the, so does the air. Air, it's, air is not completely passive to thermal radiation. It's transparent to visible. I mean, we see right through it. But I've, sh I've showed you already that infrared light, sometimes it doesn't, you know, things, things are different in the infrared. And so the air isn't quite as transparent in the infrared as it is in the visible. So what that means is the air is capable of absorbing and emitting infrared light. It's glowing to some extent. It's emitting thermal radiation of its own. 
And if you look finally at sort of where, where then does the Earth's thermal radiation come from? If you were out, out in deep space looking back at the Earth, we would look there and we'd say, well, gosh, you know, it's, some of it's coming from the surface, but some of it's coming from the atmosphere. Where is it coming from on average then? Well, the Earth's, average, Earth's thermal radiation comes on average not from the, the ground level, because the air is involved, so it's, it's going to be above ground level. It's from about five kilometers above the surface is the effective location of the Earth's thermal radiation. Okay, so, so the average point at which it, the glow starts or, or, or originates is five kilometers up. So there is an effective surface around the Earth in the atmosphere, five kilometers above the ground, that is the source for, for the Earth's thermal radiation. And it's at that height that the minus 18 Celsius temperature is, is, is to be found. That's where it's that temperature. So down here, it's warmer. And the reason it's warmer has to do with how gases work. If you take a, a portion of gas, and a gas it has energy in it, mostly in the form of kinetic, of thermal kinetic energy. If you squish the gas, as you would do in taking it from five kilometers up to down here, as you squish the gas together to pack it more tightly and increase its pressure, you do work on it. And its temperature rises because you have put in energy into it that can go into only one form, thermal kinetic energy. Its temperature goes up. I'll show you next time as part of air conditioners. If you compress gas, it gets hotter. If you decompress it, it gets colder. That's how, in part how air conditioners work. It's that your experience, if you've ever run a bicycle pump and you pump the air into your tire, car tire, bicycle tire, it gets hot. Everything gets hot. And it's not a friction effect. It's a compressing effect. So the, 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 the bottom line finally is that although the air is minus 18 up there, it's plus 15 down here because there's a temperature gradient. Bringing the air from up there, that light fluffy stuff way up high, down here it compresses and its temperature rises. So we're down here in, in this environment that is at plus 15 Celsius on average, you know, averaged over the year, averaged over the globe, all the averages. It's about plus 15 and that's determined by getting the thermal balance between the sun coming in and the radiation going out and the effective location of that radiation, which is about five kilometers up, and this, the thermal gradient in the Earth's atmosphere, which is something like 6.6 .6 Celsius, degrees Celsius per kilometer. So hopefully some of that follows. But let me now to make, make the, the final statement is, and I got about the right time for doing this, is that the height of that effective radiation, thermal radiation, depends on how dark the atmosphere is in, inf in the infrared. The darker it becomes, the more effective each portion of air becomes in emitting thermal radiation, the, the higher the effective radiation surface goes. If, we, if, we, if, if, the, if the atmosphere were totally transparent, the effective ra thermal radiation would come from the ground. It's not totally transparent. As it gets darker, the effective location, the air becomes more and more and more important in the thermal radiation. The higher and the higher that radiating surface goes, and the more thermal gradient space there is to work with. So if we push that minus 18 degrees Celsius layer from five kilometers to six kilometers up by, by stinking up the atmosphere with stuff that's dark in the infrared, like carbon dioxide, methane, um, as we do that, there's more uh, distance between the minus 18 Celsius and down here where we live. If we, put it, if we shove it up, Another kilometer, that's 6.6 .6 more degrees Celsius uh, temperature difference. The, air's, we, air, the 18 degrees starts higher. We have to pull it down farther, compress it more to get it down here. It's hotter. So that's what we've been doing in, in, since the Industrial Revolution. Is we, we, have been we have been lifting the, the effective radiation surface higher and higher and making it hotter down here. And with more heat around, as, as we've and I've talked to some that thermal energy, you can't do much with it directly. But with temperature differences, you can, you can turn some of it into work. 
And so you get storms that are driven by temperature differences. As those temperature differences get worse, you get bigger storms. You shift the phase transformations between water and liquid water and gaseous water. You mess up the rain and the, and the phase, you, you melt the snow. Anyway, I'll stop the harangue, but, but this is something you'll be dealing with the rest of your lives.